Good evening and welcome to tonight's viewing room on Brooklyn, Illinois. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Lottie Fittis and I'm the Curator of History here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. Tonight I am joined by Joseph Galloy, Robert White III, and Miranda Yancey. Tonight's program will be recorded and available on the museum's YouTube page. So here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum, we are currently uh, hosting an in-house exhibition called Community African-American Freedom, Perseverance and Leadership During Migration. As part of this exhibition, the museum features the early history of Brooklyn, Illinois and mother Priscilla Baltimore. Brooklyn, Illinois was the first African-American town to be incorporated in America. And the community's rich history from freedom settlement to the stop on an underground railroad on the Underground Railroad is being preserved by dedicated scholars and community members that are with us this evening. Tonight's guests will discuss the early history of Brooklyn and how its history is being preserved today. So let me share a little bit more about tonight's presenters. Robert White III is a proud native of Brooklyn, Illinois. He uses his talents, abilities, and voice and connections to advocate for the village of Brooklyn and share her rich legacy with the world. Understanding the necessity of preserving the historical and cultural legacy of America's first black incorporated town and driven by a desire to challenge inaccurate and biased narratives of Brooklyn. Robert serves as an active member of the Historical Society of Brooklyn, Illinois, where he is currently under the tutelage of the founder, Roberta Thompson, and is being prepped to fill an integral gap and carry forward the bright torch of the village of Brooklyn. We also have Joseph Galloy, who is a contract archeologist and college lecturer. He holds a PhD in anthropology from Harvard University and more than 25 years of experience directing pre-Columbian and historic period archeological investigations in Southwestern Illinois. His engagement with the citizens of Brooklyn has been the most personally rewarding aspect of his career. And we also have Miranda Yancey. She serves as the Illinois Inventory of Archaeological Sites Technician for the Illinois State Museum. She was previously employed by the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, where she first became involved with the Brooklyn Public Engagement Program. She is a native of Southern Illinois and earned her BA in Anthropology and MS in Geographical Studies at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Thank you all for being here tonight. And to our viewers, please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk via the comment section on Facebook. We will address questions at the end. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to present tonight's program. All right. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joe Galloy, and I'd like to introduce this uh, discussion about Brooklyn, Illinois by giving you a little bit of a sense of what we're going to look at. Uh, first, we're gonna explore Brooklyn's present and its past. Uh, then we're gonna look at how the archeological work that Miranda and I got involved with, how that arose and how the historical society started and the, the two things are linked together. Uh, then we'll look at some of the accomplishments of this project and uh, conclude by looking at some future goals. Great. Well, uh, yes, thank you for having us tonight. Um, and I, I would also like to thank the Illinois State Archaeological Survey for uh, continuing to support this program and our research um, and work in Brooklyn. So Brooklyn, Illinois is a small town located about two miles north of East St. Louis in St. Clair and Madison counties. Brooklyn's early to mid 19th century economy was focused on the riverfront, but also included raising and driving livestock as well as farming. After the industrialization of East St. Louis, Brooklyn transformed into a suburban town and local meatpacking and manufacturing jobs became plentiful. However, Brooklyn's heavy dependence on its neighbor ultimately led to economic disaster as a result of the collapse of those industries that followed World War II. 
the presence of nearby company towns also took away from the town's tax base. Today it consists of about 700 mostly African American residents and it is, is experiencing a rebirth and grassroots effort to promote its important history. So um, some folks may know the town of Brooklyn by the name of Lovejoy. Um, and the name Lovejoy was adopted by uh, the Brooklyn post office that the Brooklyn we're speaking about because there was already a, another Brooklyn in Illinois in Schuyler County. Um, so there was some confusion with, with two, two Brooklyn post offices being in, in Illinois. So um, our Brooklyn decided to renamed their post office Lovejoy, and this was after um, Elijah Lovejoy, the anti-slavery activist who was actually murdered only a few months after Brooklyn was platted. So if you've, if you've heard of Lovejoy, you've, you've heard of Brooklyn. Um, by 1828, the land that is now the village of Brooklyn became property of a man named Thomas Osborne. Um, Osborne gained this property via marriage, um, and we know he was a Methodist and a very religious man. He platted the town in two parts. The lower two thirds was platted in 1837 as Brooklyn. Um, for this town, Osborne actually sold four fifths of his interest to four other proprietors. And one of these proprietors was also um, an anti-slavery Methodist minister from St. Louis. A year later in 1838, Osborne platted Upper Brooklyn as sole proprietor. Upper Brooklyn would become the focus of black settlements, uh, especially early on and it was adjoining to Osborne's current property at the time. Um, and it was located on a, an elevated ridge area. So it would have been better um, to withstand the flooding that was frequent in Brooklyn. So <clears throat> by 1873, whenever the town was incorporated as then these two villages became one and today they're both known together as Brooklyn. And this was, as Lottie mentioned, the first majority African-American town to officially incorporate in the United States. So we have some descriptions of the town during the 1840s, and that indicates that about 40 to 50 black and white families were living there. Um, it, it was also a bustling steamboat stop. Uh, unfortunately, Brooklyn eventually lost the steamboat stop as they started constructing dikes in the Mississippi River to save the St. Louis Harbor. Well, these caused soil accretions to form on the Illinois side, and whereas Brooklyn used to front the river, they eventually lost this river frontage. So <clears throat> we did look at the, all the historic records that we could find, but besides the historic records, we also have the oral history of the town. And this tradition remembers a black settlement before platting that was known as Freedom Village. It said the Freedom Village was founded in 1829 when Priscilla Baltimore led 11 other families of former and fugitive slaves to that spot to form a squatter settlement. Um, and while the historic record doesn't support an exact date of 1829, it, it shows that the oral tradition is essentially true. Um, and we have secondary sources that corroborate um, a black settlement present there before platting. Let's see if we want to move on to the next slide. Uh, being the first majority black town to incorporate isn't the only thing that makes Brooklyn so significant. It's also one of the, one of a few antebellum black towns to still exist in the United States. Um, and its people and churches also played an active role in the Underground Rail Railroad. Early Brooklyn was an ideal location for a stop on the Underground Railroad. It was located directly across from St. Louis in the slave state of Missouri. Uh, it was the, a prime spot for fording the Mississippi. We know a steamboat stopped there, and we know there was a ferry just north of Brooklyn and just south of Brooklyn. And many of its early residents were free Blacks and former slaves, so they were very eager, eager to form an independent and cohesive community, a refuge community, where they would help slaves escape across the Mississippi River and then transport them north to stations um, in Alton and Rocky Fork, Illinois. The most influential founder of Brooklyn who embodies a self-reliance and self-determination was Mother Priscilla Baltimore. Priscilla Baltimore was born in 1801 in Kentucky. As a child, she was sold downriver to New Orleans by her father and master. And there she was eventually sold to a Methodist minister 
who allowed her to purchase her own freedom. At this point, Priscilla tracked down her father who had moved from Kentucky to Missouri. He, she located him and actually purchased her mother from her father. And it's, it's just such a dramatic, inspiring story, but she, she was able to get her mother and they went to St. Louis together um, and she began working there. At that time, she worked as a nurse, a ladies nurse, um, sometimes a washerwoman and as a chambermaid on the Mississippi River steamboat. And if you know anything about steamboat culture um, and the Underground Railroad, it, it was a, a, a vital path on the way. So the fact that Priscilla was involved with the steamboats, worked on the river, would have just aided her ability to help free slaves. <clears throat> So while she may have traveled back and forth to Brooklyn, um, the first documented evidence of her actually living in Brooklyn comes from an 1839 uh, tax assessor's book. And 1839 is also the year that the traveling minister, AME minister, William Paul Quinn was given shelter by Priscilla and the Brooklyn AME church was born in her home. Priscilla also helped found the St. Paul's AME church in St. Louis, and she left her estate to that church. After the Civil War, Priscilla continued to be involved with the church and in relief societies that now aided Black migrants moving north. Priscilla seems to have left Brooklyn by 1870. Um, we, we can't find her in the 1870 census, um, but she appears in the 1880 census back in St. Louis, where she died in 1882. Sadly, she died not too long after her adopted grandson, Milton, died in a railroad accident. Priscilla was very widely known at the time of her death, and there were very lengthy obituaries that were printed everywhere from the St. Louis newspapers to different religious news outlets, um, and even in Harper's Bazaar um, had a death notice for her. And so while she's not as well known today, she really was, she was actually considered a historical figure in her time. And hopefully after this presentation, more people will, will recognize her and um, we, can, we can help get her, her name and history out there. Um, on your screen right now, you can see some uh, of excerpts from these obituaries and articles, as well as the only known photograph that we have of Priscilla Baltimore. Um, one thing, oh, did you have more to add, Brian? Oh, go right ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to add uh, one of the more um, a personal and um, fascinating examples of the strength and courage of this woman was that when she tracked down her father, um, she berated her father for selling her to the point uh, where he broke down into tears. So I, I, I think some of the her personality and the courage really kind of comes out in her story. It certainly does. I, I think she's definitely the most in, inspirational figure I've ever had the honor to study. Um, it's just, it's really amazing what the, she was able to accomplish all of that. Um, and I believe she was about 27 whenever she got to St. Louis. So um, this was in a, in a fairly short time that she was able to, to regain her family. Um, and so after getting to St. Louis, working the steamboat, she was also working along the Underground Railroad. Um, and probably before she came to St. Louis, she was involved with this because it, it seems she worked on other rivers before coming to St. Louis. Um, but yes, yeah, so she, it's no surprise that she was a worker on the Underground Railroad because of her river connections. And also because she was a member of the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And for folks that don't know, um, the AME Church was, was known as the Abolition Church, and many of its ministers and churches were all active participants or stations on the Underground Railroad. <clears throat> so we have tales of Priscilla ferrying slaves over from St. Louis to Illinois to hear AME ministers speak. Um, and we also have tales where she helped AME ministers that were fleeing arrest in St. Louis. Um, at one point, they were not allowed to preach there. So she would help rescue them and ferry them to safety to her home on the Illinois side. And one interesting thing in the historic record is that we were able to find assessor's records that show 
Priscilla did own a watercraft during antebellum times while she lived in Brooklyn. So these tales of her ferrying folks over seems to be corroborated by that. Um, today, Brooklyn retains a strong sense of community and the tenacity and resilience that recall those of its earliest Black settlers. The town is also unique in that it has produced a very large number of talented and prominent entrepreneurs, artists, athletes um, for such a small town. Go switch to the next slide. So Annie Turnbow Malone is one example. Um, and the Peoria Museum have, has included her in their community's exhibit. And uh, while she wasn't born in Brooklyn, she moved to the town in 1900 and she began developing her revolutionary hair care products there. She later uh, founded a cosmetology school in St. Louis called Poro College that was very, very successful. And she actually became the first black female millionaire. And if Joe and Robert, yeah. if you'd like to speak about some of these other Sure. Um, just a couple of other examples of the um, luminaries that this town produced. Uh, Hamiet Blewett is, um, or was rather, uh, uh, very uh, well known as uh, one of the world's greatest baritone saxophonists. Uh, some of you folks may have uh, heard of a group called the World Saxophone Quartet, and he was uh, a founding member of that. He also played with Charles Mingus and um, so several other prominent uh, figures in jazz in the 1960s, 70s, and, uh, and up until recent times. Another um, example of a prominent Brooklynite is um, Prince Joe Henry. He was uh, a Negro League all-star infielder, and uh, he passed away shortly after we started uh, work on this project. Uh, Albert King, one of the greatest uh, guitarists of all time, uh, a giant towering figure of the blues, uh, made Brooklyn his home for uh, some time. And um, he, uh, in the 1970s, actually recorded an album um, called Lovejoy, uh, a little bit about his hometown. Uh, Al uh, uh, Robert, did you have anything to, to add about Albert? Yeah, so, so as a Brooklyn Knight, uh, obviously uh, I've had either, you know, heard stories or, or had some direct contact with some of these individuals. My mom often talks about my mom, my family grew up on what's known as Short Street or Third Street. Albert King lived not too far away. And so my mom often tells the tale of how she would sit outside as a young girl and she would get a free concert because Albert King and his band would be practicing in uh, their garage and she was only an earshot away. And she, could say, she said that she could always tell when he was coming back to town because this big tour bus would always uh, come into town and it was a big spectacle. I had the pleasure of, of personally interacting with uh, Prince Joe Henry. Uh, actually, one of the, the the highlights of my childhood, you know, would be walking to school. He would be out on his porch drinking coffee. Uh, he had a big dog I, I was afraid of. I think it may have been a German Shepherd. But uh, Prince Joe was a very gentle man, uh, kind of like a grandfather type of a figure. And so I really enjoyed. We didn't talk long. Uh, but, but the interactions that I had with him, not even really recognizing, I was a fan of the Negro Leagues at the time, but not even recognizing that he was a Negro Leaguer and a professional athlete. Uh, in college, you know, I, I reached out to him. He was writing for the Riverfront Times at the time. Uh, he was writing a column called Ask the, a Former Negro Leaguer. And so we started to communicate and uh, I tried to get him to come down to my college, Southeast Missouri State. However, at that time, he was having some health issues, uh, but had some really rich, you know, conversations with him, not just about baseball, but about politics. And his grandson, uh, Sean Muhammad, is doing a great job uh, today, really keeping Prince Joe's legacy alive. Um, I'm going to get... Um give you guys a little bit of an introduction to how uh, renewed interest in Brooklyn began. And it's a really interesting, uh, I think, personal story of just how uh, a chance encounter between uh, strangers can lead to something uh, unexpected. Back in 2007, I was working uh, at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. Uh, we were digging a, a very large pre-Columbian settlement that is within the city limits of Brooklyn. 
uh, but east of the settlement itself in a, uh, in a rail yard. And uh, we were digging there for years. I think it was maybe four or five years, something like that. And uh, I, one of the last years we were out there, uh, we, were, we were digging and, uh, you know, as occasionally happens, archeologists get visitors to sites and, you know, we interact and talk to them and they have questions. And um, one of them was Roberta uh, Thompson. Roberta uh, was in town for her mother's funeral, I believe it was. And um, she thought, what, what are all these people doing here in Brooklyn, you know, digging in the rail yard? And she got really interested in the fact that Brooklyn had this deep uh, past of uh, Native American or American Indian occupation. And she went home really excited about uh, this new information she had about Brooklyn. In the process of delving deeper, she began to learn things about her own hometown um, that she didn't know about its historical significance, uh, particularly that dating back to the, uh, uh, the early and mid 19th century. And she got together with some other uh, leaders of the community. Uh, Mayor o, former Mayor O'Bannon was one of them. Uh, some other folks, uh, Mr. George McShan, uh, the town's sort of um, unofficial historian. And they formed the Hist Historical Society of Brooklyn, Illinois. At the same time, we were working together to create a public engagement program within the University of Illinois uh, at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. And our goal was to help the Hist Historical Society fulfill its goals and to try to um, lend our expertise to uh, serve the Historical Society's ends. So at this point, I'm going to, uh, as mentioned, my name is Robert White III, and I am a proud Brooklynite and a member of the Historical Society of Brooklyn. I'm going to just take a few moments to speak about uh, the three essential core functions of the Historical Society. So first and foremost, uh, our, our main function is historic uh, preservation. The Historic Society of Brooklyn has a vested interest in preserving the oldest Black cemetery uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, now, there is some paperwork that, that has to be filed before that uh, process can move forward. However, that is something that is definitely a, a project that we're looking forward to moving, advancing really soon. Uh, we also have a vested interest in Quinn Chapel AME Church, uh, which is really the, the last standing historic uh, structure in Brooklyn. Uh, the Quinn Chapel currently is seeking support for renovations that need to be done to the church. Uh, Quinn Chapel AME is a member of a larger governing body of the AME church. Um, so they're kind of working through that process, uh, but we're definitely ready and willing to stand in the gap and support Quinn Chapel as the only remaining historical structure still standing. Uh, our second function really is retelling Brooklyn's story. Uh, the reality is, as you all have you know, witnessed so far, Brooklyn has a rich history. But the unfortunate reality is uh, many people you know, don't hear Brooklyn. I would tell people often I'm from Brooklyn. And the first thing they would say, oh, I didn't know you were from New York, right? I say, no, Brooklyn, Illinois. Oh, I've never heard of it. Many people have never heard of Brooklyn. And when they've heard of Brooklyn, uh, quite honestly, it's, it's, it's often biased information. It's not the most positive information. So the Historical Society of Brooklyn, Illinois, has a vested interest in really retelling the story of Brooklyn, but also challenging the, the negatives that are out there, that nothing positive has come out of Brooklyn or will come out of Brooklyn. We, we believe that's absolutely false, and we're, we're out to uh, counter that narrative. Our final focus really is uh, the development of a heritage-based heritage development. Uh, we have future, future plans to develop a cultural center, which I'll speak about a little bit more. Uh, currently, the Historical Society of Brooklyn does not have a permanent home. We don't have a, a structure. Um, so that's one of the challenges. However, after speaking with uh, Joe recently, there may be some other possibilities 
that we can entertain to make this reality uh, come true. Yeah, one thing um, I wanna just to, to add before moving on is that uh, the National Register listing uh, for Brooklyn is something that we've been kind of working towards for, for several years, actually uh, dating back to the early days of this project. Um, people both in Brooklyn and outside of Brooklyn, when we would talk about Brooklyn significance, both in regional, state and national history, they would say, well, how come this isn't on the National Register of Historic Places? It's very clearly an important historic place. Um, and I think we're at a point now that um, perhaps the, we're moving closer to that. Um, Miranda uh, had worked on a National Register a nomination form, a preliminary form, and submitted it recently to the uh, State Historic Preservation Office. And uh, we expect uh, to hear some news, I think, tomorrow. Is that right? Yes, hopefully tomorrow. Right. So everybody, we've all got our fingers crossed that um, that things will move forward in that direction. Um, right now, I'm going to look a little bit at um, archaeology. We've, we've talked about history and, and what we can learn from um, documents and historical records, uh, or I should say oral history, but most of what happened in the past, and this is something that archaeologists will uh, often tell people who aren't real familiar with the field, most of what occurred in the past uh, is not recorded or is not embedded in historical narratives that are passed down orally. Most of human history is underground and it presents an exciting opportunity for another way of looking at the past, particularly in context when we don't have really good historical records that talk about uh, something like the formation of Brooklyn. And at the onset of this project, when we decided to do some archeological exploration of the town, we had a few goals. One of those was to try to figure out where the Freedom Village was. That's kind of a real basic question. You look at the uh, platted town of Brooklyn and you go, where, where is it? It's a fairly large community. Um, and so we had to narrow that down and archeology span is one way of exploring that. Um, one other potential thing that can happen as a result of archeological work is that we might be able to see the transformation of Brooklyn from the Freedom Village, a refuge community, to a formally platted town. That's also something that we don't really have a good record of. Um, and of course, one reason that documents don't tell us a lot about this time is that uh, communities like Freedom Village uh, were often founded um, under the shadow of repressive laws that were meant to keep African-Americans from settling in places like Illinois. Uh, also as a participant on the Underground Railroad, um, those sorts of activities are things that you want to maintain a low profile uh, for uh, to create the context uh, that would allow you to engage in um, helping freedom seekers north. And so the crucial early part of Brooklyn's past is something that is really only accessible, as far as we can tell at this point, through excavation. Um, last, one of the goals of archeological work relating to Brooklyn is to try to um, point out that Brooklyn's uh, historic past lies intact underneath the ground. And that fact alone qualifies it uh, for listing on the National Register. So that's one route that, um, that we hope that we can um, pursue that will help Brooklyn uh, attain that National Register designation. Uh, before I uh, kind of outline what we did with the archeological work, I wanted to, to point out that when we engaged with this um, uh, community in doing archeological work, we were using a, a model that is called community archaeology or community-based archaeology. And community-based archaeology is an important development in archaeological work over the last few decades. And it helps to restore some of the power imbalances that have often existed between archaeologists uh, and the wider world 
and local or descendant communities. In fact, archaeology doesn't have a really good uh, track record when it comes to engaging local communities um, in a respectful, uh, appropriate manner. And that's not just in the United States, it's, a, it's an issue around the world. And using the community-based approach, uh, we can sort of turn that um, on its head, turn the, the power imbalance on its head. And in this case, say, we've got some expertise that we can lend to this community. Tell us what you'd like us to do. Uh, we're not doing this archaeological work for our own edification or you know, building our own careers, but to actually try to help the community's goals. And that's been the model since the, the very beginning of this undertaking. In 2008, we engaged in a two week long survey of a part of Brooklyn that is uh, called Upper Brooklyn, as uh, Miranda mentioned. There's a, you can actually see in the northern part of Brooklyn there, uh, north is up on this map. There's a line that runs diagonally through uh, the lots. That's the dividing line between the two platted uh, communities. And we focused on Upper Brooklyn because it was the most likely place for the Freedom Village to have been located. We, uh, Miranda actually did all the historical research for this. She, uh, or at least the vast majority of it, she compiled information from census records, from deeds, uh, county tax records to locate the lots that were purchased around 1840 to 1850 or so uh, that belonged to some of the founding families of Brooklyn, including Priscilla Baltimore. And the lots that you see highlighted either in yellow or green were lots that we decided we wanted to take a look at. Uh, the assumption here was that a, uh, the Freedom Village would have been occupying space that was not formally structured. And that if we looked at the lots where people purchased um, the, their property, that it might correlate in some loose way at the very least with the organization of Freedom Village. And we um, first approached this problem by uh, knocking on doors. We knocked on uh, a lot of doors and uh, we got permission to, everywhere we asked, we got permission to, to dig. And it was primarily in people's backyards. Uh, the, the lots that you see outlined in, uh, or colored in yellow, uh, we wanted to get to, and we were actually able to, uh, to test those or to, to survey them. And the ones that were in green, we wanted to, but for one reason or another, it was typically because it was covered with asphalt or was inaccessible in some way, we didn't actually look at in the survey. And the process of doing the survey was to uh, punch through the surface soils. And you can see in the lower left-hand part of the slide, one of our uh, archeological field techs using a post hole digger to uh, get a small sample of soil deep underneath the ground. Uh, Brooklyn was raised over the uh, last hundred years or so to avoid the effects of flooding during heavy rain uh, showers. And so these layers of fill had to be penetrated before we can get to the original ground surface. And we worked for about a week and we weren't having much luck, but at right about the end of the first week, we started hitting what we were looking for. The uh, upper left hand part of the slide shows uh, some pre-Civil War or antebellum uh, pieces of pottery. These are English made. These uh, fragments are typically very sensitive to the the manufacture date and the breakage date uh, when people were using them. And we were able to use that uh, information or this, these artifacts to, to key in a particular location. Uh, in this case, it was, um, you can't really see it on the screen here. I don't know if anyone can see my mouse moving there, but um, no, okay. One little spot on the upper left-hand part of the, the, um, the, the map, there are three, yellow lots that uh, are all in a row. And that's where we started detecting these, these pre-Civil War artifacts. And our next step was to excavate a couple of test units. These are about three feet on a side. And we dug down through those layers of historic fill till we got to the original soil. 
we dug through that, the original topsoil, until we exposed the, the yellowish subsoil that is underneath that. And the trick here is that when somebody digs through the ground into this subsoil, and that later on fills back up with uh, soil, it creates a stain. And what you can see outlined in red here is um, part of a, a rectilinear feature that we think might be an exposed cellar. We don't know for sure, but it's consistent with uh, subfloor cellars that were used for storage at, uh, at the time, roughly, of the Freedom Village. And we recovered some artifacts that you could see in the um, upper right-hand part of the slide, a little piece of a medicine vial, some very uh, thin pieces of window glass, also consistent with an early occupation, a uh, little piece of brick, and also a teacup foot ring that was also uh, consistent with an age somewhere maybe in the 1830s or so. So we were pretty excited about this. And uh, that day when I got back to the lab, I gave Roberta a call. And I told her that we might have found some of the, the earliest uh, remnants of, of Brooklyn's occupation. And she got really emotional about that, that, you know, we found them, you know. We're, we're not 100% sure if we have located the Freedom Village definitively. That's something we'd like to explore in the future. But I think we're tantalizingly close to being able to say um, that, that we have. And at the very least, we've proven that there are intact archaeological deposits that relate to Brooklyn's early history, and that's what makes it significant. In 2014, we decided to do some exploration of the uh, only lot that we can really definitively link Priscilla Baltimore's um, residency in uh, via documents. Is that that's correct, Miranda, right? Yes, um, we we know when she first moved that she per purchased three lots in Upper Brooklyn. One of them um, is the lot that Quinn Chapel now sits on, but we don't know which of those specific lots she was residing on. But in 1851, she had um, a new house constructed at this lot here that we um, we were investigating that lot in 2014. So it's right. Yeah, so this was uh, something that we thought might be um, really um, kind of like a low-hanging fruit, something that if we were able to show a definitive connection between Priscilla Baltimore uh, and the physicality of Brooklyn as it is today, uh, in this case underground, that it would really strengthen that case for National Register eligibility. And we um, spent about a month digging her house lot, it was relatively small, I think about 50 feet by 50 feet. And we uncovered the remnants of some stones that were footings for a building. And then we also had several other archeological deposits, uh, including things like uh, privy vaults, the upper right-hand part of the side, you can see a slide, you can see a, a wood line privy vault. And um, we dug several of these and recovered Quite a bit of material out of them. The unfortunate thing is that it seems that all of the archaeological features that we dug, these privy vaults, cisterns, and, and so on, were related to perhaps Priscilla's abandonment of her house lot when she moved back to St. Louis. Uh, you could see on the slide there is a, an 1876 dime. And uh, when you find a coin with a date on it, it gives you a little bit of a uh, precision, you know, you know that uh, someone couldn't have been uh, filling that feature in before 1870. So uh, this does seem to have been uh, mostly related to people who lived on Priscilla's lot after she left. Uh, the other thing is that it's not all negative. This was an important time in Brooklyn's history when the Black majority of the town began to wrest control of the city council uh, away from the white minority of Brooklyn and um, was intimately involved with the transformation, rapid transformation of Brooklyn into an all black town. So there is additional research potential represented by some of these later archeological deposits.
So um, in the course of our research, we were also able to solve a really important mystery for the town of Brooklyn. And that was, where is Priscilla Baltimore now? Um, no one knew where her, where her burial site was. Um, and it was something that, you know, really, really needed to be found out. So I was lucky enough to come across her 1882 St. Louis death register record. And this record indicated that she was buried in Belfontin Cemetery in St. Louis. And if you've been to Belfontin, you know, it's a very historic cemetery. Um, very many prominent folks from St. Louis are buried there. Um, and it's just a gorgeous place to visit. Um, and in 2010, the Historical Society um, had raised funds to place the, the headstone you see here on your screen um, for Priscilla and also her adopted grandson, Nelson Carper, who she was laid to rest next to. Um, and that was, it was a wonderful day and it produced more pros positive press coverage. Um, with, we had news stations and reporters out there. Um, and it was just a great celebration of Priscilla and uh, an honor to be a part of. So um, another success of the Brooklyn Public Engagement Program involved Quinn Chapel AME Church. In addition to being founded by Black abolitionists, prominent in the anti-slavery movement, and having congregants active on the Underground Railroad, the Brooklyn's oral history recognizes that both the antebellum church building and the original basement of the present building as stations on the Underground Railroad. The church was constructed in its present location and renamed Quinn Chapel after William Paul Quinn in 1878 but it's believed that the original basement of the church dates to antebellum times when Priscilla Baltimore actually owned the lot. Um, because of this rich history, Quinn Chapel was accepted into the National Park Service's Network to Freedom program in 2013. And this is a national program that recognizes historic sites that have a verifiable connection to the Underground Railroad, um, as well as research institutions and interpretive centers uh, on the Underground Railroad. But it was a, a very big success for the town and, and for, for Quinn Chapel. Um, I believe they've been looking for some uh, recognition for a number of years. Um, so we were, we were very pleased to be able to get them listed on the register there. As uh, Robert mentioned before, the um, current situation with Quinn Chapel is a little perilous. There has been some structural damage that was um, recently detected in its south wall. And um, I believe right now that uh, Quinn Chapel is looking to, uh, uh, to raise funds to help repair the structure, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, just to share a little bit about some of the, the press coverage that Brooklyn has gotten since the beginning, uh, since the Historical Society started their efforts. Um, I've got on this slide here a, a few things that uh, uh, Brooklyn has been featured in. Shortly after our work in 2008, the Illinois State Museum had an e exhibit on Lincoln. It was called From Humble Beginnings, Lincoln's Illinois, 1830 to 1861. The artifacts that we uh, had discovered during our survey were exhibit at the Illinois State Museum. There was also a little um, showpiece on uh, uh, Priscilla Baltimore's life. The uh, town has also been covered by uh, uh, WGN TV. Uh, when people hear about Brooklyn, they wanna know more about it. So it's attracted attention from the press. In 2014, St. Louis Public Radio did a piece that was actually aired nationally about the work in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, in, uh, I don't quite recall the year, I think maybe 2012, 2013, um, Miranda and I and uh, Mayor O'Bannon uh, appeared on a talk show on um, RAF STL, it's the classical station in St. Louis. And uh, this is just a sample of some of the, the positive press that is being generated by the activities of both the, the engagement program and the historical society working together. 
All righty. So on Saturday, July the 10th, uh, the Historical Society of Brooklyn uh, had a dedication ceremony from the Freedom Village Monument. This is uh, a process that had taken several years, but we finally got the, the monument installed. Rain was in the forecast and we went back and forth uh, about whether or not we should move the event inside. But fortunately, the rain held off long enough for us to uh, hold the event outdoors. Had a really nice turnout. We had members of the local community, members of the press, the Belleville News Democrat, which did a really good job of uh, featuring uh, stories about Quinn Chapel and, and the monument uh, leading up to the event, the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, uh, and members of, you know, the, the Bell Fountain Cemetery and members from other communities as well. Uh, it was a really joyous occasion. Uh, the event happened on July the 10th, two days after the founding date of Brooklyn, which is July the 8th, 1873. So it was a moment of commemoration and celebration together, but it was also really a catalyst for uh, a sense of renewed community pride in, in, in Brooklyn. So I think Joe has a clip that he's going to play, a short clip of a balloon release that we did in honor of Mother Priscilla Baltimore. In honor of Mother Baltimore and 11 families, first Mrs. And the voice you heard uh, leading the boom, balloon release was Roberta Thompson, uh, my auntie, who I'm being groomed by at this moment to be more versed in the history of Brooklyn. In terms of future plans, what's next for the Historical Society of Brooklyn? So after laying down the monument, uh, we have plans for establishing a memorial walkway. And this walkway will really be a safe place, a place for uh, beauty. Uh, a heightened sense of community to commemorate Brooklynites from the past, uh, to celebrate the rich legacy of the many families that have added to the positive uh, legacy of Brooklyn. In addition to that, we also have future plans of establishing a cultural center. Again, we have a strong commitment and a strong tie and a vested interest in Quinn Chapel. So we would ideally love to establish that cultural center uh, in the basement of the the Quinn Chapel AME Church, but again, um, there's some things that are are in in pending uh, motion right now, and so that I believe concludes our presentation. So I know we have a few moments. I don't know if we have time for questions. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Lottie. Yeah, so thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions and I would invite anyone at this time, if you have any questions, to go ahead and put them in the comment section on Facebook. Um, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive in here. Um, let's see. Okay, so were there any indications in your research um, as to how or why uh, Priscilla Baltimore was so well known um, at the time of her death? Was it related to the establishment of the Freedom Village or her role that she played with uh, the churches? Um, any indication on that? Um, so she was well known as a, a ladies nurse for prominent white women in town. And she actually um, worked on the steamboat of, of Captain Daggett, who was one of the first mayors of St. Louis. So she knew him very well. He vouched for her when her uh, emancipation was registered in St. Louis. He also, she was divorced in the 1850s and he traveled to Illinois to testify on her behalf. So she had really high up connections and she was you know well known in the black community but also in in the white community as well okay. i think one of the um things mentioned in one of her uh, obituaries was that if um you know you saw her you knew that she was probably going to come up to you and, and ask for you you know to donate to one of her causes uh, she was a very well-known fundraiser as well Anyone else want to add anything to, to that? Good. Okay. 
Um, so could someone describe a little bit about um, more specifically what is a freedom village or what constitutes a, a freedom village? Is there an official definition or um, could anyone expand upon that a little bit? I'm, I'm not too aware of an official definition. It's more that that's how the town remembers it as freedom village. Um, and, you know, in, in African American archaeology, there is also just the concept of refuge communities. And it, it's essentially like a refuge community. It, it was, um, it, they were there for, for the purpose of freedom and for helping others obtain their freedom. Sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, let's see here, what else? Um, I think we've kind of already covered that one. Um, how, how much resistance did uh, the African American community um, face or come up against uh, during that time period, specifically with the um, Illinois Black Codes or um, the racial prejudices of the of the period? Um, in your research or anything, did you come across any of of that sort of information? You know, there's. There's some Brooklyn residents that you see registering um, in St. Clair County, but not all of them. And it, it really seems like Brooklyn kind of did its own thing. And <laughs> um, I can't say of anything that I've no, come I mean, across. I think, I think that speaks uh, again towards just the historic uh, nature of, of this town mm -hmm. and, and why it should be uh, well known. Um, yeah, just one, one thing to add to that. Uh, people um, are often unaware that the land of Lincoln was not an abolitionist state. It did not have an abolitionist constitution. And it actively um, seeked to prohibit um, free black settlement in Illinois. And it did it through um, some uh, legal restrictions. And one of them was that you uh, if you were a free African-American, in order to settle in a particular place, let's say in St. Clair County, you had to post a uh, bond at the, at the county courthouse, and I believe it was about $1,000, which was a fortune uh, in the, the uh, first half of the 19th century, a uh, considerable amount of money. And so Brooklyn was really swimming upstream, even in a place like Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very true. And I think they also had to have... So you had to pay the bond. And then I think you also had to have a letter with so many signatures, people vouching for you. Um, yeah, it's very interesting um, um, time. And, and thank you for, for adding that. I think that's important for, for people to know in regards to Illinois history specifically. Um, let's see, okay. So this is kind of one for each of you to maybe answer um, separately. So from your unique perspectives through studying Brooklyn and other historic, historic towns, how can people today be successful purveyors of history to preserve the past and present uh, for, for future generations? So what, what can we all do to, to help Brooklyn and, and other communities who are, who are going for the same effort? I think from my own perspective, uh, I think it's uh, the, the very first thing is getting the word out. Um, people need to be aware of the historical significance of, uh, of the place that they call home. Um, I met many people in Brooklyn in the early days of the, uh, the project when we were doing our survey. And some folks were well aware of the, the town's history, other people uh, we're less well versed in it, and that tracks really well, I think, with just about every community in the United States. Um, you grow up in a place you don't necessarily know its deep history. You kind of know what you uh, what you're experiencing now, and I think the historical society got it right when they established that as one of their main goals: increasing awareness of Brooklyn's significance, not just outside the community. But in the community itself, that can help 
you know, the, the overall endeavor be successful. I think Robert could probably talk a little bit more about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the baby of the Historical Society of Brooklyn. I'm the youngest member. Uh, I do a lot of work with youth. And so I think that it's imperative. One of the things that I've been promoting with the Historical Society is uh, just intergenerational relationships where the young uh, folks can get the history, sit at the feet of the elders. Uh, there's something special and unique about that. But really, it's our youth that will be the, the lifeblood of the community. And so we wanna make sure that our youth, obviously they can turn on the news and they can hear some of the narratives that aren't the most positive, but we wanna make sure that our youth, uh, not just our youth, just youth in general, uh, have access to the rich history of Brooklyn and also understand that they play a role. So, right, we take time to commemorate and honor Mother Priscilla Baltimore and the 11 founding families. But one of the things I'm most excited about is I get to continue that work forward. I get to continue in the spirit of self-determination. And so I think that's something um, big. It's just bringing, bringing that intergenerational dialogue uh, to, the, to the center and making sure that our youth are equipped and empowered with the rich history that Brooklyn um, has so that they can, you know, have a, a boosted sense of confidence, but also share that message with the world and keep our community thriving and alive. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. That intergenerational intergen um, necessity is, is so Im important, and especially when it comes to, to history and knowing your history, um, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, we can continue to get more people involved. Miranda, did you have anything to add? You know, just as, as far as what people can do at, in their own communities, then, you know, I think like Robert said, try to get those intergenerational relationships, record people's stories before it's too late, um, you know, really just try to spend time with them and, and, and get to know them, hear the stories, and it'll bring a whole new world to life uh, you never knew about before. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And go, go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, I was going to, to ask Robert, um, from your perspective, what, uh, how do you see the Historical Society and uh, this, this program overall, how has it changed the way people look at Brooklyn within the community? Yeah, well, I can honestly say I've noticed uh, even since the, the July 10th monument dedication has boosted uh, a heightened sense of confidence. It's added a sense of beautification uh, to the community to not just hear your your history, you know, from an oral telling, to have, but to have a monument that uh, documents that history. I see this as being a catalyst for, you know, increased uh pride, awareness, and just an overall heightening of, of just positive vibes in the village of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and I would just like to add, um, you know, I came about learning about Brooklyn um, when I was in, in grad school. I actually learned about Brooklyn and um, New Philadelphia, which is another uh, town featured in the exhibition that we have here right now. And um, they just stuck with me, their stories. Um, I was digging through archives and I was responsible for reading um, newspaper clippings that would be part of this future program for the Lincoln Home. And um, anyways, uh, the, the history of, of these places, they're, they're impactful. And I think the more we can get the information out there, um, I hope they stick with some people like they stuck with me. Uh, because I eventually got to a ability to where I was able to put together this exhibition and um, share with people here in central Illinois about these stories. So I just think what the Historical Society and Miranda and Joseph, what you all have done um, to support and raise up uh, this history is, is wonderful. Um, so I have one last question uh, for Robert, but anyone else is welcome to jump in. 
Um, can Robert, can you tell us what's next for the uh, historical society? So we know you just recently had the dedication. Um, you talked about a couple upcoming projects and and the overall mission, but um, what what's really on the horizon uh, for for the historical society? Sure. So our immediate uh, primary focus is the uh, installation of the Memorial Brickway, walkway rather. We're constantly looking at several companies trying to figure out which would be the best um, to get construction underway. We want to move that process forward relatively quickly. Um, so that's the biggest thing on the horizons. We will actually, and I, I failed to mention this earlier, if people want to keep up with the Historical Society and what's going on, what's uh, coming up next, you can follow our Facebook page. That would probably be, be the best way. Soon we will be launching a GoFundMe campaign uh, to assist in some of the fundraising efforts for the Memorial Walkway. Great, and I will um, tag the Historical Society in the comments um, at the end of the program. So before we wrap up, we are at the hour mark. Would anyone like to add any, any last minute uh, comments or, or questions to one another or anything? No, just thank you so much for giving us, you know, a chance to present this information. And I know it's been just a, a really good experience working with, with Brooklyn for myself and others, so. Yes, I, uh, I have to say it was kind of in the little bio that uh, working with uh, citizens of Brooklyn has been a, a high point of my career. It's been a very enjoyable thing. Um, by and large, the work that we've done has uh, been on a volunteer basis. So a lot of the research that we've done has been um, things that we've done is kind of a labor of love. And uh, I wanted to, uh, again, reiterate uh, what Miranda said earlier is that uh, a lot of the support for this uh, endeavor came from the Illinois State Archaeological Survey uh, at the University of Illinois. Um, ISAS is still supportive of the project. Uh, Miranda and I were both at ISAS when this was uh, going on. We've both since moved to, to other places, but um, I did want to point out that the uh, Office of the State Archaeologist has still uh, expressed interest in uh, supporting this program uh, in the future. Yeah, and I would just like to say thank you on behalf of the Historical Society of Brooklyn, Illinois, as well as the Village of Brooklyn. Platforms like this are super important, right? They allow us to tell the positive story of Brooklyn and to challenge some of the narratives out there. Thank you to Joe and Miranda for the work that you all have done over the years and all of your uh, team and colleagues and organizations you've been associated with. And uh, yeah, this has been great. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us uh, for this evening's program. A quick reminder that if you haven't had a chance to see the museum's exhibition, Community Af African American Freedom, Perseverance, and Leadership During Migration, uh, it is now open on August 26th. We will be hosting a special dedication in the Owens Gallery, which is where that exhibition is located from three to five. So we hope that you all can make it then. And also thank you to the Museum's Visionary Society and museum members, as well as our guests tonight, Joseph, Robert, and Miranda for putting this wonderful program together. Uh, thank you all. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.